Pray with me. Gracious Lord, we um, thank you so much. And we know your spirit is moving within this place, for this is hallowed ground in which we are walking, in which we are standing, in which we are now sitting and hearing your word proclaimed. Let your word uh, speak through me, and let it not be as me, O God, and let us all draw nearer to you and hear the exact thing that you need us to hear this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in the middle of a series called uh, As You Are Going. It's, uh, it, it's taking that, uh, the Great Commission in the Matthew 28, where it says, therefore, go and make disciples, looking at that word go and seeing how it's actually used in the language, and that uh, what Jerry, uh, in a couple sermons ago, taught us is in the process of going. And what I am setting out to do is tie a real nice bow on everything that we, that we learned in the fall, and as we get ready into go step into the hope of Advent, is what does it mean to live as people who have these sent out lives, to live as we go? How does that show up in our lives, how to, and how do we do that? What is, what is Christ really calling us, us to do and, and to live out? And so uh, last week, uh, we, we preached, I preached 40 minutes. So I don't know if everyone's keeping time of that one, please. Um, so we'll see if we can go 45 minutes today. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, we won't do that. Um, but I, as I was joking with Jerry, I said, it is such a big, big topic, this as you are going, to kind of narrow it down into, into, into the two weeks. And, and last week, we, uh, I really wanted us to understand the idea of what it means to be a witness, and that witnessing for the defense of the gospel, to, sh to live in such a way as you go that people see how you interact, how you think, how you talk, what you do, all those actions, they see that and they realize that you are different. They realize that you have a different hope than they do. They realize that you have a different sense of purpose and a different sense of faith. And it's all because of what you know to be true in your hearts about Jesus Christ. And so therefore, as you go, witness to that in your love, in your deeds, in your actions, and your thoughts, do that. That is that first part of that great commission. Now, at the end of the day, because I struggle with this and trying to really convey the urgency of what it means to as you go, Jerry, myself, the staff, we've talked about this. We've talked about, okay, how do we convey this to people? How do we convey the urgency of as you are going? And really and truly, it really does come down to a heart issue a heart issue for ourselves, to wrestle with what does my heart truly, truly believe? And does my, do I have a heart that is in alignment, that follows, that breaks as Jesus' hearts break? Jesus' heart breaks. He doesn't have two. So as I sat there and I thought about that and I thought about sending, I thought about, the, I thought about basically the ultimate sending. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. If you think about that for a second, if you just sit on that for a little bit and understand the purpose and the intent behind how God sends. So he sends his son to do what? To save the world. He sends his son at an appointed time to an appointed family, to an appointed government power, to an appointed season of conflict within the Jewish faith community, and it is all appointed by his hand and by God's hand to send his son into the world at that specific time to save the lost. And as we watch Jesus' life from then on, his ministry and mission and how he interacts with the disciples, Jesus then flips the script and does the same thing with disciples. He sends them out. And he then also sends you and I out. The scriptures pull the veil back, and we see that in Jesus' prayer. He sends us out to do the same. Why? Because Jesus' heart, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Jesus' heart breaks for the lost in such a way that God sent him, interrupted humanity, to make sure that that was possible, that the lost would be found, the sick would be healed, the sinner would be saved. And then he sends us to do the same. This, what was it, past Easter, we looked at a prayer in John chapter 17. As I say, pull the veil back and we can kind of see God's heart in this of what it means to send folks out. Jesus, in the shadow of the cross, he gathers his disciples together and he prays for them. And he not only prays 
for them. He prays for us as well, future disciples. But listen to exactly what he prays. In page 1073 in the Pew Bibles, you can open them up, John chapter 17. Listen to the words in which Jesus speaks to his Father, prays to the Father for his disciples and future disciples. And we can kind of pull the veil back and see why it is so important, why our hearts need to yearn and break to be sent out for the lost. It's because Jesus has prayed this into mission. John chapter 17, verse 7 through 23. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. This is Jesus praying to the Father. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those in whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. For while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. I have given them a testimony. They have witnessed who I am. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but only that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, make them holy in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only. Do not ask for these 12 only, he says, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one just as you, Father, and me, and I, and you, and that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, that was a lot. I, I purposely took a moment to really read that part of the priestly prayer so that you can kind of tie all this stuff together. He says, they believe. They believe the truth in who I am. And so now I'm leaving, and they're staying behind. So God, protect them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world. Send them into the world. Send them into the world so that the world knows who I am and that you have sent me. And the prayer goes on, and I'm going to show here in a little bit later, but I'm going to give it away now. The prayer goes on so that they can be with me in heaven, so that the world who receives their message can be with me in heaven, so that the lost and the sick and the lame, they can be with me in heaven. This is Jesus' heart. My friends, is it your heart? We need to embrace and understand that this is our appointed time. Just like God had an appointed time to send Jesus, this is our appointed time. You are here. You work in the place that you work. You go to school in the place that you go to school. You are married and have children in a place, in a city, in a town, in a family. All of this is appointed for this time. And if you have professed a faith in Jesus, if you have witnessed the truth of Jesus Christ, if your dead soul has been resurrected by this truth, if you know the gospel then the appointed time is right now. We've been saying, you go nowhere by accident. There is a plan and a purpose and a reason for you being there. So as you are going, you live these lives out as a witness for the gospel. And what we see today, live these lives out with a heart that breaks for the lost. Lord, open our eyes that we may see and break our hearts for what breaks yours. Can you hold that statement in your mind today? 
Can that be a bold prayer that we all pray each and every morning? Lord, open my eyes that I may see and break my heart for what breaks yours. Because this is what will fuel your sending. If you have known this truth and witnessed it and you don't share it with somebody else, then we need to re-examine did we actually understand the gift of grace in which we received? Do we actually understand the depths in which Jesus went to save the likes of you and me? Open my eyes that we may see and break my heart for what breaks yours. And that, that is where we find the capital C church in this appointed time right now. The gospel tells us that the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. I was watching a sermon by a guy named Matt Chandler. He's one of these, um, uh, he, he has a, a, a really big church that's going on right now. A lot of folks, uh, our, our student minister, our children's minister, people in, in those circles really, really enjoy this Matt Chandler guy. I've listened to him. He's got some great, great things to say. And he gave a message that's kind of like what I'm giving today. And I pulled some of those quotes out because, quite frankly, he says it better than I do. But he says this in the idea of being sent. He says, have the confidence in doing that because the, the bar of defending the gospel right now is set very, very low. And what he means is, look, just think of our world right now in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of social unrest, in the midst of divisions between race and gender and generations, in the midst of everything that is going on, the bar is set very, very low because people are hungry for hope and light. And so you all, we all, we could be visible representations of darkness being defeated by light. So therefore, as you go, living out as sent ones, Live in that way so that people will have that hope. Open our eyes that we may see. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Let's dive in. What does open my eyes mean? Why do I need eyes to see? Why do I need eyes to see this world? Well, because this is exactly what Jesus himself did. If you go through the Gospels and you read through his interactions and you read through his comings and goings and how he goes from city to city to city, from town to town to town, from village to village to village, he doesn't stop seeing people. There are times where he tries to retreat, and what happens? The people follow after him, and he only gets a couple of seconds of rest, and then he goes and he continues on to tend to the needs of these people. If you were to look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, which we're going to look at today, there's this whole line of folks that he interacts with, and a repetitive word of Jesus seeing these people. So if you look at the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 9, it opens up with the healing of a paralytic. Getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And so we know that the paralytic gets healed. Well, then the Pharisees and the other people that are there are looking at it and they start grumbling and, and they don't see, they don't understand what Jesus is doing. So he corrects them. He sees the Pharisees, their lack of faith, and starts to correct them. But it doesn't end there. Jesus continues on. As he goes, there's more that happens. He comes in contact with Matthew. The gospel continues. As Jesus goes, he sees Matthew. Matthew, a tax collector, the lowest of the low of the entire society, right? No one wants to talk to tax collectors because they take your money. And so there's Jesus, and he sees Matthew. Now understand, it's not like, oh, hey, Matthew, how are you doing? He sees Matthew and sees them with the eyes of the Messiah, knowing who Matthew is going to be. And he calls Matthew out of that old life, and he goes and he dines with him. And then what happens? All the muckety-mucks, they see what he is doing, and they say, what is going on with Jesus? He can't be trusted. And so Jesus corrects that. 
And then he continues to go. And as he goes, a woman who has been struggling with constant bleeding comes up to him and he sees her. She touches his cloak and she is healed. And he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. And then we go on to a, uh, to a girl who has died. And he says, surely she hasn't died. Just she's sleeping. And he sends people out and he resurrects her up from the dead. And then as he continues on, he comes in contact with blind folks and he gives them their sight. And as he continues on, he comes in contact with someone who can't speak and he gives them their words. This is all as he goes. Jesus sees the needs and he attends to them. This is a character point of Christ. If the call for us is to live as Jesus lived and to go as Jesus went, then it goes to understand to do what Jesus does, which is see folks for who they really are, to see them as lost, to see them as helpless, to see them as sick, and, and do something about that, provide something for them. You, there's, a, there's a whole passage in, in, in the Gospels, I believe it's in Luke, that talks about the, the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep for the one. You've heard that story, right? I mean, all the 99 are, 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 are fine, but the one is lost. And so he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And when he finds the one, he rejoices, he's happy, he has a party because he's found the one. That's how much his heart yearns for finding the lost. And then there's the woman with the coins, and she loses one of the coins. She's got a t t all the rest of them. She's fine. She loses one, and she tears her house up. And when she finds the one, there's rejoicing, and there's a party because the one has been found. This is a character point of who Christ is. And so when Jesus says, therefore, as you go, make disciples, therefore, as I am sending you out, he's saying, I'm sending you out with that same heart. Go and see people. See them for who they are and attend to their needs. Now, what is the issue with that? The prayer that we've been saying is, open my eyes that I may see and break my heart for what breaks yours. You see, the issue that holds us back from as we are going, living a sent out life with that level of compassion is the question, does my heart truly break for the lost? Now, there is a song from Casting Crowns called Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And they use that line. It's where I got it from. I'm not that clever. And in the song, there's a refrain, break my heart for what breaks yours. And it's repeated through. And I, when I heard that, I was troubled to the core. I entered into the wrestling pin with Jesus. Anytime that you have a question in which you wrestle with, it typically means that you need to come out with a new idea if you're going to wrestle with Jesus. If you're going to enter a ring, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lord, please be ready to come out with a new perspective. And so I wrestled with that. Does my heart truly, truly break for the loss? And if I'm being honest, I think it comes in waves there's times where I get it. There's times where I, I, I'm in step with the Spirit and, I'm, and I, I'm going with it. And then there's other times where my life is just too, too busy. I got three kids. I've got a beautiful wife. She's sitting right over there. I've got this job. I work for this guy over here. Am I good? No. And so there's just the, there's that constant busyness that can have me wane in that feeling does my heart truly break for the lost? Does your heart truly break for the lost? And how you can tell is, do you just check off the box for compassion and, 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 and seeking out people and helping them? Do you just kind of write a check and, and it goes to missions and you've, you've checked off the compassion box and you just go about your life? What would it look like in our communities? If we lived as people who have hearts that break for the lost as Jesus' heart broke? What would it look like in our working environments if we had a heart that broke for what Jesus' heart actually broke for? 
What would it look like if we actually seed people in their afflictions and we, and we provided some sort of help and we sat with them in their sufferings and we listened to their stories and we, and we hugged them in their sense of loss? What would happen if we would see people lost in their addictions? And instead of just like, I don't want to be with that, but actually get with them and help them and get them to the place where they can have some sort of healing. What would happen if we would see these things in our community and actually did something about it? What would that look like? There are churches with neighborhood communities that do prayer walks, that do all sorts of stuff so that they can be a part of this community that surrounds them and so that they could be a light in the darkness for them. What would that look like? Now, there are folks in our church who do that I think of Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall, who has now gone on to receive his eternal reward. And Dr. Hall lived a very good as you are going life. When his daughter asked him if, about going into the mission field, what it is that I should, should do when I get there this last time, he said to her, cement relationships. Cement relationships. Dr. Hall was all about knowing people and sitting with them in the midst of what they are struggling with, hearing their stories, and then probably telling a story in return that lasted a little bit a long time, but <laughs> that's all right. So, but I mean, he did that. I said to the family, it was a master class in pastoral compassion when I worked with Dr. Hall going on deacon visits because, boy, he just knew. He knew how to sit and see them and be with them and provide the very thing that they may need, which could just be a listening ear, a compassionate heart, whatever the case. In Matthew 9, at the end of those healings, in verse uh, 35, Jesus says this to the, to the folks. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages and teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. That word compassion in, I believe, Latin means to suffer with. In the Greek, that word compassion means a pain, a gut-wrenching pain in your stomach. Actually, it's a gut-wrenching pain a little bit lower than your stomach, but we don't need to get graphic. It is a gut-wrenching pain pain inside of his stomach. Can you, he sees the crowd and sees their sicknesses and sees their diseases and he has compassion for them. He wants to be there for them and provide the healing for them. So he looks to his disciples and says, listen, the harvest is ready. The word has gone out about who I am. It is ready, but unfortunately the laborers are few. So pray to the God of harvest that he would cast out, he would send out laborers to reap the harvest of souls. And then the gospel goes on and Jesus sends out the 12. This is before the Great Commission. Sends them out into the cities and gives them authority to do exactly what he did, heal the diseases and proclaim the good news. Gospel Luke talks about when they return, their minds are blown as to what they have seen by just going out and seeing people and healing their afflictions. Oh, Lord, open the eyes that we may see and break our hearts for what breaks yours. Push back the darkness and be lights in the world, carriers of visual representation of the darkness being defeated by the light. That came from, from Chandler's message as well. In fact, Matt Chandler gave an illustration about the Sahara Desert, that there's actually communities in Africa that have banded together to create a great green wall of trees, and they've planted them all around, and their hope is to go from coast to coast with this and stop the Sahara Desert from continuing to kind of take over their lands. They're putting up this green wall of, of trees and all sorts of stuff, and I read up on it a little bit. I mean, it's producing jobs, it's producing community, it's producing life. Oh, church, who live as as you are going people, we're the great wall of hope. And so if we, we band together 
and we are visible representations of light defeating darkness. Can you imagine that great wall stopping the darkness that is impeding our generation? If only we had eyes to see and a heart that breaks for what Jesus' heart breaks. To have that level of compassion. I'll end with this story. In the Gospel of Luke, there's a parable called the Good Samaritan. Raise your hands if you've heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, good. Amen. Let's go home. <laughs> you get it. No, the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? A lawyer comes up to Jesus. A lawyer who loves the law, loves the facts. He comes up to Jesus and says, teacher, and he's trying to test Jesus. He wants to trip him up. Teacher. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is Luke chapter 10, verse 25. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? The Lord answered, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So score one for the lawyer who gets the law correctly. He, he properly announces the first and the second part of these greatest commandments. The, I believe it's the Shema in, in, the, in the Jewish faith where they adorn that on their doors, where as they come and go, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And this love your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus, uh, Leviticus. And Jesus, you know, has said that this is what you sum up the law as. The lawyer gets it right. But he doesn't have the heart behind it because Jesus says, great, you answered correctly, do this and you will live. And the lawyer comes back because he doesn't like Jesus' answer, and he says, well, then who is my neighbor? Because I know lots and lots of people, and there are people that I enjoy loving, and there are people that I don't enjoy loving. And so who exactly is my neighbor? Because I want to focus on them. I don't need to focus on the ne'er-do-wells. And then here comes this, this, this parable of the Good Samaritan. And what is, how does Jesus explain it? Okay, so there was this guy, and he was coming down the road from Jericho, and, and this road, you need to understand, is a bit of a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and that robbers and, and cave dwellers and things like that, that is a very, uh, that's a very prominent problem. And so Jesus uses that in the story. And so this guy who's leaving from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho or vice versa, but anyways, he's on this road, and he gets attacked by robbers, and he's in bad shape. And so who starts coming down from this road? A priest. A priest is coming down from this road. A priest who has been in the temple, who has done all these things. He comes down on this road. He sees this, this wounded man on the side of the road. And he says, oh, no. And goes on to the other side and keeps on keeping on. He doesn't see him. He doesn't truly see him. He doesn't see his needs. And he's probably captured by fear that if I stop, I too am probably going to be overtaken by robbers. So you're on your own. I got to get going, pray for you, thoughts and prayers, right? And off, off he goes. And then the next one that comes is a Levite, also a holy type of person who should know better, sees him, and the goes on the other side of the road, he doesn't take care of him. And then a third person. Now, the way Jewish parables should go, this third person ought to be a lay person, ought to be a Jewish person, because that way this story would then encapsulate everybody, the holy folks and the Jewish people. But in Jesus' story, it is not a Jewish person. Who is it? It is a Samaritan, an alien, someone who is not of their world. Are we seeing how we're going to connect the dots here? Jesus prayed, they are not of this world, remember? So a Samaritan comes who is not of that world, and he sees this hurting person, and he stops, and he attends and he pours oil and healing things on him. And he puts him on his donkey, and they go and they ride into an inn, also a dangerous place, but they go to an inn, and the Samaritan gives two denarii to this inn person, which is a lot of money, says take care of everything that he needs, and if he charges more room service, I will come back, and I will pay that off as well. And so then Jesus looks back to the, to the lawyer and says, okay, so who's the good neighbor here? And the lawyer says, the one who has given grace and mercy. And Jesus said to him, well then, you go and do likewise. 
See, the lawyer wanted to know what a neighbor is, and Jesus slips it and says, well, let me tell you how you neighbor. The lawyer wanted a noun. Jesus said, no, it's more of a verb. This is how you neighbor to somebody. You have the eyes to see that they are hurting and a heart that breaks to provide whatever it is that they need. And so, my friends, my church, may our prayer be every morning, Lord, open my eyes that I may see and break my heart for what breaks yours and seize the moments in your appointed time and place to actually see people for who they are in need of hearing the gospel, maybe in need of hearing an encouraging word, maybe it's in need of just sitting with them in their suffering, and, and you do that. Not so that you could be the great somebody, but so that you could be a witness to the defense of the great hope in which you have. That, my friends, is how we stop the Sahara Desert of despair and darkness to be the great wall of hope for this world. Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, you, you have taught us so much in the way that you, which you have lived. And as we've prayed in our prayer of confession, we have been poor neighbors. We have consistently put ourselves in charge of our lives, in charge of our world. We have, we have taken for granted the things that you have given us, the blessings in which we have received, and therefore we don't actually see the needs anymore because we're taken care of and we can just keep on going. Oh, Lord, open our eyes to see the hurting world that might be around us, that might be in the cubicle next to us. Let us see that and have a heart that reaches out not necessarily to beat them over with the Bible and the gospel, but to sit with them and hear them and give them hope, the hope that you have given us so that they may come to know the grace and mercy that you've shown us as well. Open our eyes that we may see and break our hearts to, for what breaks yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, Savior, who was sent by God himself to save and heal the lost, prayed to the Lord, prayed to the Father, and said, I am going to you. They are still here. Keep them in the world, but save them from the evil one, so that they may go. This is what it means, so that you all may go and reach the lost with eyes that truly see and a heart that truly has his compassion. This is inside of you. If you profess a faith in Jesus, he has promised this and prayed for it in existence. So therefore, go, not by accident, but go as people who have been sent and know that wherever God is sending you, he has a plan, a purpose, and a reason for you being there. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen. <laughs>